What's up guys and welcome back to another episode of Shark Bites. Today's episode is definitely different from what we've ever done before on the channel and I don't really know how it's gonna go. <laughs> the idea actually comes from a longtime subscriber of the channel, Steph Sands. Steph has been commenting for over a year letting me know that she really, really wants me to do a video all about how to apply first aid to a shark bite victim. It's actually a very good skill to have in your locker if you ever find yourself in a situation where you might have to use it. And this could happen anywhere as well to someone you know or a complete stranger that you've never met before. Whoever it is, having this skill and being able to perform it properly could actually end up saving their life. I should stress to you all here straight away that I am in no way, shape or form a medically trained professional. I do have a first aid certificate and an emergency first responder qualification, which is pretty standard for anyone who does regular diving or spends time on boats. I would straight up recommend doing those courses though, guys. They are really, really important qualifications for anyone to have, in my opinion. And also, they're not really that expensive to do either, but I do get it at the moment, money is a little bit tight. If you do end up taking one of those courses though, you're then actually qualified and you're not having to rely on a makeshift YouTube video to perform these skills like the YouTube video that I'm about to show you. <laughs> so sharks bite people, it happens. Fortunately, I've never been bitten by a shark, nor have I been around anyone who's been bitten by a shark. But from what you hear from people who have been in those situations, they can be pretty chaotic. Often there can be a lot of blood and people around panicking or crying, combined with someone who's lying on the floor, potentially bleeding leading out. So in a situation like this, it's really important to stay calm, keep a clear and focused mind, and remember the things that I'm about to teach you. Shark bites can range in severity from fairly mild to absolutely horrific, depending on the size of the shark and how aggressive the attack was. But the first thing you should do before anything else is call 911 or 999 or whatever the medical emergency number is where you live. The person that's been bitten is gonna need professional medical attention and quickly. And once the emergency services have been called, if deemed necessary, then you can start administering first aid. It's at this point you need to assess how bad that wound is. And if it is particularly bad, you need to control the bleeding. Putting pressure on the wound is the main thing you've got to do, either with medical gauze or a towel or a bit of cloth. If you're really out in the sticks and you've got no medical supplies, it's probably going to end up being something like your t-shirt or a towel. You might have to be putting that pressure on exposed muscle or fat tissue, and that's going to be pretty grim, but it's very important you do this. If the bleeding isn't stopping, don't remove the cloth that you've added, just add more to it. Now, I did read some really interesting research from Dr. Nicholas Taylor of the Australian National University Medical School not that long ago. And he's proposed a pretty interesting treatment for a shark bite where the victim has been bitten on the leg. This is, to be fair, a pretty common place for people to be bitten by sharks. More often than not, it's one of the limbs. Anyway, Dr. Taylor maintains that stopping the bleeding is the most important factor in saving someone's life. And the technique that he proposes is to cut off all of the blood flow from the femoral artery. The femoral artery is one of the major blood vessels in your body and it carries blood to the lower half of your body. If this thing is leaking blood, you are gonna bleed out very, very quickly. And the technique that Dr. Taylor proposes to cut off blood flow from this artery is actually pretty simple for anyone to do. You basically make a fist with your hand and press this into the central point between the hip bone and the groin. Then you lock out your arm and apply pressure using your body weight until blood flow from the wound stops. And doing this can help buy the victim some time before help arrives. The technique that I've talked to you about there is supposedly taught in medical schools and performed in emergency departments when the victim is losing a lot of blood from the lower half of their body. Dr. Taylor believes this is a better treatment for severe wounds than simply just applying pressure to the wound site. And it might be a judgment call that you have to make at the time as to how severe that wound is. It actually got published in a medical journal fairly recently and in the trials, using the fist femoral artery technique, they managed to stop all blood flow to the leg in three out of four participants. And when they compared that to tourniquets, those only stopped 44% of the blood flow, but we're gonna talk a little bit more about tourniquets later. Obviously, this fist femoral artery technique only applies to those who have been bitten on the legs. There is a pressure point on the arm somewhere between the elbow and the shoulder, and when pressed, that can also stop blood flow from a bite to that region. And then there's one behind the knee, which might work for bites on the lower legs or the feet. Applying pressure to these areas is always recommended because it's just going to reduce blood flow to wherever the wound site is. And stopping that wound from bleeding is really important in saving someone's life. Okay, so we mentioned tourniquets earlier, and the reason that I've saved them for last is because generally, 
they're a last resort. Tourniquets should only be used in real dire circumstances, i.e. the emergency services are gonna take a really long time or they're not gonna be able to get there at all. Usually if you've called the emergency services, they'll be able to give you some guidance as to how long it's gonna be before they arrive. And they can also advise you as to whether to put the tourniquet on or not. The reason why tourniquets are considered a last resort is because although it might save someone's life, it might be at the expense of injuring or losing a limb. So with tourniquets, only use them if the choice must be made between losing a limb or losing a life. In an imaginary scenario, let's say someone's had their hand bitten off at the wrist. In that situation there, it's probably best to get the tourniquet on as quickly as possible. Often in the context of a shark bite, you might be in a location where medical supplies aren't readily available or there's no tourniquet kit nearby. So you're gonna have to create a makeshift or improvised tourniquet with whatever materials you have around you. Now, I don't wanna just tell you how to put on an improvised tourniquet. I wanted to show you and to do it, I've got this handy Halloween arm. <laughs> Look, I tried to get one of those medical training arm dummy things, but you wouldn't believe how much they cost. Wanna have a guess? 1,100 pounds, 1,100 pounds for a medical training arm dummy. So realistically, I was always gonna buy this. <laughs> I'll be honest, it's not the best. and um, There's definitely gonna be a few caveats with it, but you'll get the general idea of what an improvised tourniquet looks like and how to do it. Okay, so we've got our injured limb here. In this case, it's an arm. I've got a bandage here for our improvised tourniquet, but you can use any strong pliable material, whether that be bandages, gauze, clothing, whatever it is you've got to hand. Importantly here, don't use things like rope or wire or shoelaces because it's just gonna cause damage and cut into the muscle of the limb. Generally, you're gonna want something that is relatively thick. Obviously, if you've got nothing else, using something like shoelaces is better than nothing, but if you can, try and get something a little bit thicker first, like clothing. In terms of your placement of the tourniquet, you're gonna wanna put it about four inches or 10 centimeters up from wherever the wound site is. But importantly, never place the tourniquet directly on the wound itself or over a joint like an elbow or a knee. If it just so happens that 10 centimeters or four inches up from the wound happens to fall over a joint, then just go a little bit higher. It's usually best to put tourniquets directly on the skin, but if you have to put it over the top of clothing, that's okay. In this case, we're definitely putting it over the clothing because I'm pretty sure this Halloween arm is full of toilet roll. <laughs> So we're gonna imagine there's a wound somewhere here towards the lower section of the arm. And our tourniquet is gonna go a little bit further up from that section, so probably somewhere around here, making sure that it's not going over the elbow joint. Does this squishy arm even have an elbow joint? I'm not really quite sure. Anyway, we're gonna place our tourniquet underneath the arm and then tie a knot just like this. There we go. Nice firm knot, like that. Then we're gonna to need to use something to tighten this tourniquet up. So I'm gonna use a knife in this example, but again, it can be anything that you have to hand, a piece of strong metal or some strong timber or something like that. Be careful about using things like pencils or pens because as you tighten this tourniquet up, something like a pencil or a pen is just gonna snap. Your tightening device needs to be able to withstand quite a lot of pressure, so choose it wisely. Okay, so you're gonna place your tightening device over the top of the wound like this and then tie it again with your bandage. Just like that, in a normal knot. Pull that bandage through and tie it nice and tight. So it just sits on the top like that. See it just sitting there. And then using the device, just start to slowly twist it around and tighten it. Now, this is gonna be really, really uncomfortable for the person who you're doing it to. So just try to reassure them, tell them it's gonna be okay because it's gonna get tighter and tighter and tighter. This has got to be really, really tight as well, guys. So make sure as you're doing it, you're having a look at the wound and seeing if it's stopped bleeding yet. If it hasn't stopped bleeding, you're gonna to have to go tighter. So once you think you've got your tourniquet in the right position and at the right tightness, you can loop the tails of the bandage around the ends of your tightening device, flip it underneath, and tie a little knot. Normally you wouldn't be doing this on a severed arm, so it'd be a little bit easier. <laughs> and there we go. That is your improvised tourniquet. If for whatever reason at this stage when you've tied it at the bottom, if you still see some more blood coming out of the wound site down here, you can undo that last bit and tighten the tourniquet even more. But the main thing is once this tourniquet is tightened, 
don't take it off. Leave this in place until they can get professional medical attention. Also, make sure you don't cover over it with anything like a towel because once the emergency services arrive, if there's something like a towel over it, they might miss it. So make sure it's visible and when the paramedics do arrive, tell them that you've applied a makeshift tourniquet. If you've got something like a pen handy, you can write a T on their forehead and the time at which you applied that tourniquet. That's quite a handy thing for the doctors to know when the victim gets to hospital because the doctors know then exactly when that improvised tourniquet was applied and that can probably help with their further treatment. Remember though guys, improvised tourniquets are only a last resort. You'll have to make the call in the situation yourself and every situation is different. But if the victim is losing far too much blood and you can't stop the bleeding, then a tourniquet is probably needed. One thing I'd probably recommend doing is practicing how to do an improvised tourniquet on some kind of makeshift dummy arm. You can fill up a pair of tights with some newspaper or toilet paper and practice on that if you like. You could also use a family member or a friend to practice on, but if you are gonna do that, make sure you only use that to practice where you would tie the knots. Don't tighten up the tourniquet really tightly on another human being's arm because you are gonna cut off the blood flow to their limb, which can obviously be incredibly dangerous. So just be sensible with it if you're gonna do it that way. I think personally, it's probably better to do it on a fake or a dummy arm because that way you can make sure you're practicing how to do it nice and tight. And also that way you're not causing your grandma's arm to fall off. So there we have it guys. Those are your first aid treatments for victims of shark bites. I hope that myself and none of you guys at home are ever in the situation where you're gonna have to use those skills because I imagine it's pretty traumatizing. But having those skills stored in your locker could be the difference between someone living or someone dying in a situation like this. If you did find today's video at least somewhat helpful, then please do give it a like. It's massively appreciated by me. But before you head off though, we've learned today how to treat someone who's been bitten by a shark, but how do you stop yourself being bitten by a shark in the first place? Well, you're gonna wanna click on this video right here where you're gonna learn all about shark threat displays. And in that video there, you're gonna see what signs sharks give off before they become aggressive and before they bite. So it's really, really important that you can recognize these signs to stop yourself getting bitten. So give this video a watch.